the human experience viewed from the creativity perspective. Based on the journey of exploration into our creativity, given all that has been observed about our creativity and our creative experiences, the question that can be asked is what model or paradigm seems to best fit the human experience? That is, how should we view our lives and the events that occur in our lives that allow us to hold our creativity sacred, optimize our creative power and creative ability, and experience the most fulfilling life possible to us? The perspective presented here is based on answering the question, is there a way to view creation that no matter what a person believes, they will have some type of experience of that belief such that they can point to that experience as proof of what they believe is true. And a variation of this question which asks, was there a way to view creation that would support such personal and subjective experiences as true? The answer to this question is that we are creators and we create both our experiences and the reality of those experiences and creation is magical enough to mold itself to give us those experiences. The question then becomes how does creation work that this is accomplished? Now you can take what is provided here as sheer fantasy, a nice story, or a plausible way creation works. It's your choice. It is recommended you eat and digest what is provided here, keeping what works for you, making it your own, and discard the remainder. But you are reminded what is provided here, the focus of this recording is directed at empowering our creativity and our creative imagination and uses the creativity perspective. It is directed at stretching our perceptions about reality. Some of the concepts presented are analogies and serve as a pedagogical purpose. One should not assume that they are exactly the way creation works, but are effective for our creativity in the exploration of our creativity and of creation. Although some of these concepts may be used literally in some situations, you are encouraged to see them symbolically. It is clear that when we are in our body having our physical experiences, almost everything is taken very seriously. The pain we experience, the hunger we experience, the tiredness we feel, the importance of the task that we are asked to do in this life, all of these are very real to us and very important to us. To suggest any of what we do is unimportant seems to be sheer fantasy. Yet all that we do is like simply playing in a sandbox. When the sand is moist we can mold it into structures and forms. When it dries it retains its shape for a while, then eventually it all falls back into the sand from which it arises. None of it lasts. All that remains are memories. So to our lives and what we do in our life. Other than the attachments which we hold consciously or unconsciously, all that we thought that was important in the past is gone and we do not really know what will be important tomorrow. All that is really important is how do we choose to respond to that which is before us in this moment and what attachments to the past cause us to respond as we do. Ideally, it is to let go of all of our past attachments and be fully open to the present moment. However, given our body and the way it is conditioned, it may be impossible to truly be present in the moment without bias from the past. As a human, in many ways our body is the past that we continually carry forward with us. Being in the body, the body is always with us and attached to us in some way till we die. Yet, it is known the body continually replaces its cells so even the body is not totally attached to its past, it does change. In contemplating this question as to how to view the human experience, it is clear there are things that we carry forward in life and we can anticipate how they can unfold to some degree. It is here we find some of our attachments to the past are very useful. Our whole education process is based on the premise and hope we pass on that which is useful. Even what may be useful in the future holds us to the past in some way. There are other attachments from the past that do not allow us to freely respond to what is before us. Many of what people call trauma experiences fall into this category. So what is this human experience really all about? Is it a dance to see what of our past is useful in the future? Or do our attachments force us to live in the past in a new way? Or is there something more occurring of which we are not aware? The journey of exploration into our creativity clearly indicated that we have a life path that some would call a blueprint or itinerary for our life. There are events and circumstances that we are drawn to experience. 
How we experience them is another question and is determined by how we choose to respond to them in the moment we experience them. In this regard, our response is improvisational. The journey of exploration also clearly indicated that there is within each of us a creative impulse, a heartfelt passion, a longing for something that calls us into life to create certain experiences within this life path and integral to fulfilling this life path. This heartfelt passion guides our life and fuels our life we have. It was also observed that the experiences we have groom us for later life experiences that we have. That is, our experiences build on each other. Each experience we have provides the opportunity to change our attachments and perspective, which in turn changes how we respond to the future events that arise in our life. Additionally, what is interesting about the human experience is we can see that we play roles for each other. Often the roles change in time whether we realize it or not. An infant grows into a child who grows into a teenager who grows into a young adult and then to a mature adult. At each of these stages we play various roles and interact with individuals in our life in a different way at each stage. Yet we each are all such good actors that we believe we are the roles we play, never really realizing our role is ever changing. At some point we identify with one of the roles or one or more aspects of the particular roles we play. Probably one of the more common roles we latch onto is the child identifies themselves as the son or the daughter of their parent and their parents see the child as their son or daughter their entire life. But neither the child nor the parent can fully grasp that any label is only that, a label. The label says nothing about the true relationship and what role each is playing for the other. Neither cannot fully grasp the role that they are being asked to play for the other. How often does the child become the teacher of the parent in some way, and how often does the parent become the perpetrator of harm in the development of their own child by its demands and expectations? It is often said life is but a dream and some religions suggest that the world is nothing but a dream like a creation in the imagination of an almighty spirit. Currently much is being said about our life being a simulation and we are players or constructs in the simulation created by a fantastic cosmic like computer. I personally have experienced where I could say life is a dream or a dream like state. But the evidence across the experience of life which individuals report suggests to me life is more of a theatrical performance, in particular a carefully orchestrated improvisational theater where our creativity is continually being called forth if we wish to accept the invitation. Given the observations made in the journey of exploration of our creativity, it appears our lives can best be described as an improvisational theatrical production that is reflected as a life path where we have the opportunity to manipulate the energy of creation in our improvisational play by what we think and believe and how we respond to what comes before us. In any way our life can be seen as an analogous stage or theatrical production consisting of acts as in plays, different chapters as in a book, or as different episodes in a television series or simply a sequential movie, however you wish to see it. Each act or phase has a loose script with a set of conditions and circumstances to which we will get to improvisationally respond for a given time period. Then the environment changes for the next act or phase. Sometimes a smooth transition occurs and we never really see the transitions, yet at other times there is a radical shift or a clear change. As any theatrical production, whether it be a stage play, television show, or movie, there's a storyline with actors, but it's an illusion and unreal. It is simply a creation of a writer, production crew, and actors. What the actors do in the play is very real, both physically and what the actors feel to fully bring forth the role they play. It is why there are stunt men and stunt women to create the illusion of the physicalness of certain experiences yet not cause the bodily harm in the experience they are simulating. Yet, when the performance is completed, the involved individuals go back to who they really are and all that was done and performed was done within the illusion of the play and anything done in the play is only an experience one has in the performance of their role. All was simply an experience to be had. The substance of the play, the storyline, can be experienced as very real 
until one wakes up to the fact that it's only a play and we see it much like a dream. Of course, there are always a few who do not leave their roles behind, but tend to continually act it out and claim their role as to who they are. Viewing our life from this perspective causes two questions to arise. One is, how is the play written and created? The second is, how do we live our lives if what is stated here is true? That is, life is simply an analogous theatrical performance, and we are only playing a role. Synthesizing all that has been observed, it appears our higher self, discussed in another recording, is the actual creator or playwright of this theatrical production, the orchestrator of its performance, and the primary actor. As a human being, we are our higher self playing the role we created and we assigned to ourselves. Our body is the physical manifestation of our higher self for the role it desires to play. We, as a human, intentionally forget our relationship with the higher self in order to have the human experience it desires. Our higher self orchestrates the play through the oneness and interconnectedness of creation. The script or blueprint, as some like to call it, identifies the vehicle that will be used, namely our body, with its strength and weaknesses, and outlines all the key events or circumstances that our higher self wishes to experience for the time and place in which we incarnate. Why? Only our higher self can answer that question for you. So feel free to ask your higher self and listen to what it responds. Within this perspective, each individual is here to have their own unique experience of creation for whatever reason they have with the storyline created by their higher self. Within the oneness of creation, the role we play for each other is orchestrated and coordinated by our higher selves, keeping to the individual story our higher selves created. As such, we need not get pulled into the drama of any other unless our storyline causes us to do so. Our human mind and its creative imagination is the tool for the improvisation and it uses whatever attachment it may have to construct its response to the experiences provided. If we do not accept responsibility for the capabilities of our mind and our creative imagination to determine our response to an experience and choose our response consciously, we become more like puppets on a string. We are puppets on a string in that we will be carried from experience to experience without any thoughts in our human mind on our part. In doing so, we never come to the realization what creative power and creative ability is available to us. That is, we would live our life more like what would be called a zombie-like, unaware state. The way this appears to work is like any actor assuming a new role in a play. It chooses to forget all of its past performance it has ever played, yet it will retain and use the key understanding about acting and develop talents it gained in the previous roles it played as necessary in the new role as a human. Some of these talents and abilities are remembered as past lives or deja vu experiences or as deep internal knowings transcending what the mind has experienced in this current life. There's an important note here. The actor does adapt their talents and learn to play their role, but they are not in the play to learn to act. They are more than capable of acting or otherwise they will not be offered the role. So to us in our life. What this means is we're not here to learn as if we're going to school, as many say. We already have what is needed. We have all what is needed. It is only a matter of learning how to apply what we already have. Otherwise, we would not be given the role and the experiences asked of us. We have all that we need for our improvisational performance. It does not mean we do not need to learn to apply our abilities in a new way, but we have what we need. The available information suggests that the awareness that lies within each human being is an aspect, a fragment, a spark of the consciousness, a unique divine light, whatever you would like to call it. Each of these fragments can be seen as a unique fragment such that each is a different arrangement of energy, a unique energy signature, much like a unique spectrum of energies unto itself, and each has a unique contribution to the whole. Yet, all of these fragments all arise out of the same consciousness. So, although each is different, each is essentially the same. So, one can ask why such differences in how humans interact in the world and with each other. One way to view this is that when an individual incarnates, the divine spark is wrapped in a case or placed in what is analogous to a unique crystal which allows this light to shine through. 
The light shining through the crystal is the life the individual lives. The crystal surrounding the light does not determine the experiences the individual has. Rather, it determines the gifts, the abilities, the tools, and the like the individual will carry into life and use in their incarnation. Each of the crystals is different for each person such that only certain aspects of the individual's light shines through the crystal. This allows for the uniqueness of each individual for the time and place of their incarnation. The crystal that encases the light is designed for the time and place of incarnation. In this way, an individual aspect could incarnate in different times and different places. In each case, the light would be the same, but the crystal surrounding the light would be different. As such, the same light will look different and be experienced differently. Stem cells are cells which have the ability to turn into different types of cells depending on the environment in which they find themselves. They are unspecialized, so they do not have specific functions. However, they are cells from which all the other cells with specialized functions are generated. They have the potential to become specialized cells when placed in the proper environment. They specialized according to that environment. They have the potential to become specialized cells when placed in the proper environment. They specialize according to that environment. One can look at the spark of divine light placed in the crystal for a time and a place of incarnating as a stem cell. Then the environment allows the light shining through the crystal to take on a form unique to the environment in which it finds itself, much like a stem cell can take on the form of the tissue in which it finds itself. How the crystal around the divine spark, which becomes the analogous stem cell to create the energy vehicle for our incarnation, seems to be created as follows. Now the gestation period in the mother's womb begins the energetic assimilation of our awareness into the physical vehicle, namely our body. The energetic assimilation is much more than simply our body forming a fertilized egg according to the biological process. That is, the gestation is more of an end result and symbolism of what is occurring. Rather, what is occurring is the assembling of an energy vehicle that is perceived and experienced as our body. As an embryo developing into the fetus, we become impregnated with the energy imprints from our mother and her environment when we are in her uterus. Here we also receive the energetic imprint of our family lineage, of which the DNA is only symbolic of something much larger. Namely, all the energetic occurrences which gave rise to the genetic lineage is carried forth in that lineage. That is, we are a composite of all the energy patterns that come together throughout evolution to create the entire process of birthing a particular human being in the form that it is. In many ways, the body is only symbolic of the dynamic energy patterns fused together to create the being that we are. This process gives us an energy vehicle with a unique energy signature in which to have our physical experience. So even before we are born into the world, we have a profound dynamic energy pattern that many have tried to describe in a variety of ways. In the literature, some traditions describe a casual body, a celestial body, an etheric body, a template, an astral body, and the like. Currently, individuals talk about epigenetics and switching genes on and off. Yet all of these descriptions are only minds conjuring up the ideas and analogies of how our creative life energy and our consciousness creates the life that it does in the form that it does. One of the major realizations in the journey of exploration into our creativity is that the human mind is incapable of fully and accurately understanding how creation works. The best it can give is an approximation and it usually does so through analogies and the proverbial it looks like, it operates like, whatever. This energetic signature we carry is beyond what most have understood about being a human being, yet it shows itself repeatedly in the experiences of life that our human mind never envisioned for our lives. In an analogous way, trying to understand how the human being arises from all that comes together to create the human energetic being it's just like trying to understand how the makeup artist creates the required makeup for many theatrical productions. The process of putting on the makeup for some roles, especially alien roles where the individual does not look like a human, that requires actors playing the role that look very different from the typical human takes enormous time. 
the process of putting on the makeup for some roles, especially alien roles where the individual does not look human, requires actors playing roles that look very different from the typical human and it takes enormous time to put the makeup on. So to the actors in this play of life have simply put on an energy signature that they take and materialize in our human body. The human body in many ways is simply the makeup we use for the role we play and experience within that role. In understanding this process of forming the body, we have the option of viewing the body as a physical vehicle or as an energy vehicle or we view it symbolically as representing all the energy patterns which compose it. Viewing the body symbolically makes it much easier to understand the mind-body connection in energy medicine. What is important here to understand is two things. One is this energy pattern established the framework or the blueprint of our life path and reflects the intention for our life. The second thing is that it is an energetic pattern. This is something that must be felt. It is encoded within our being as an inner feeling of satisfaction and fullness within our being. When mind becomes aware of this feeling, it is frequently described as a deep heartfelt passion drawing us into the world or longing for something that often gets interpreted as a longing for a beloved that allows us to feel whole within our being. In reality, it's simply the essence of our being calling us or pulling us to have the experiences to which we incarnated to do. When we do what we incarnated to do, we are energized by life itself. This makes perfect sense in realizing we incarnated for certain experiences, and as we have those experiences, we are energized by that life and catalyze us to move into the next adventure we came to have. The foundation for this play, along with the energy imprint contained in the body and the experience we have had as that actor in previous roles, is our childhood experiences and early program. They set the stage for the improvisation within the play in which we will participate. But in this play, each experience we have grooms us for both the role we play within our life and to bring forth whatever it is we incarnated to do. Initially, we learn to unconsciously respond to life. In time, we learn we have choices. Through our creative imagination, utilizing our past experiences and what we come to think and believe, we can create responses quite different than what our unconscious response would be. In some ways, it's like a soldier who's been programming throughout his life to hate the enemy and the enemy is to be killed. Yet in the moment of looking into the eyes of that enemy, that enemy he is to kill, he sees another human being suffering the same conditioning and issues in life that he faces and chooses not to kill him. The second question was how do we live our life if what is stated here is true? Simply said, it is to play the role encoded within our heartfelt passion outside of the story mind creates for each interaction we have, for we are only playing a role with another, for another, and for ourselves. To truly understand this process means to realize the key to our life is an inner feeling of inner satisfaction about what we do and the inner passion which draws us into life, whether it is seen as a desire to create something or a longing to find something. Here one would look to this inner guidance, usually referenced symbolically to the feeling within the heart, since the mind sees the heart as representing the source of our life. Here one would navigate from the heart. It is to allow this inner feeling to guide our life and look to our mind to figure out how to make it happen, given the world in which we find ourselves. The second thing is to respond to life as we feel appropriate, but to realize we are here having the experience of our higher self designed and is orchestrating. So we have available to us guidance from our higher self routinely available to us. You can look at this as an actor in the play wearing a small transmitter and receiver that is in constant communication with a particular outside director watching the play and ensuring it goes according to the overall script, realizing what is done is always being done improvisationally. So in the event the improvisation gets too far off script, we can receive guidance as to how we should change our course or adjust our actions. Or if we are faced with a situation that we seem totally ill-prepared to address or to which to deal with, we can always ask for guidance. Such guidance will then come in a variety of possible ways, through our intuition and internal knowing, a chance meeting, a synchronicity, a change in circumstances, a shifting of the wind, so to speak, or something that gives us the guidance we need. Or we may find we get nothing because everything is fine in the direction we are going. It's simply a matter of trusting the process. 
An important note needs to be made here. It was stated that the actor, when assuming a new role, forgets all their past performances. However, it also said that we form attachments and we can attach ourselves to the role we played and retain that attachment after the role is completed. Here I am reminded of a character in a television series that was truly despicable. I would cringe every time he made his appearance. Then I saw the same actor in a movie playing a wonderful loving role. I marveled at his acting ability between the two characters. However, it was hard to see him in this loving role was a result of the memory I had of him in his despicable role. This is why it is important that we forget memories of the past interactions with individuals in the roles we play so as to not bias our future experiences with the same individual in another role. So it's important to leave our previous roles behind. We can do so when we can forgive what occurred in the past and be thankful for the experience and what was provided. It's about realizing whatever occurred was only a role being played and we in some way agreed to participate. Now what is interesting to think about is if this individual in his despicable role did not leave this despicable role behind but carried it into the new role in his life, he definitely would be seen as very traumatized, broken, outside of any possible wholeness within his being and definitely would be seen as requiring years of psychological and spiritual therapy and trauma work to heal. Yet he was only playing a role and in this role he was a beautiful person. Could he not simply drop a despicable role and be that loving person as in the other movie? Could this individual simply awake and realize he's not playing the role he should be playing? But this brings up the fact that he could be playing the role he needs to play. There are roles that individuals will play for the sake of the current improvisational play one is in. We look at individuals being broken, but we never ask what role do they play or are they playing a role for others in their life and why that other person needs someone to play this role. For example, is an individual holding their trauma so they can give to the healer an experience of healing someone? After all, how could you have the experience of being a healer and holding the identity of a healer if there's no one to heal? A healer, as a creator, will need to create individuals who need to be healed for them to have their identity as a healer. This brings up one of the most interesting observations in the journey of exploration of our creativity. It was to look back in hindsight at the events that have occurred in an individual's life and see how the events in their life tie together and how the in individual interprets them and the story they tell about the events. Two things can then be done. One is to ask the individual to look at the story they tell and ask them if they can tell the story in a more positive and empowering way. The second thing which can be done and can be much more revealing. It is to look at the story they tell and within their story look at all the following and see how the events came together to weave a pattern that reflects where the individual is now. Look at their family heritage, their pedigree if you wish, the culture and society in which they are raised and its history and liabilities, their religious and spiritual tradition, its histories and liabilities, or if there was lack of spiritual or religious traditions, what was going on in their mother's life when she was pregnant, if known. Look at the world in which they grew up in, especially those early years of life before they have conscious memories. What family stresses and strains existed. Then there is all the events that the individual has had up to the moment this exercise is being done and the stresses and strains that existed in the experiences. In doing this review, we need to remember, as said above, we each carry something like a receiver and a transmitter such that we can communicate with the outside director and creator of the play of which we are participating for assistance and clarification. We can always ask why a particular event unfolded as the way it did. The response will come in a form appropriate to the play in which we participate. Then take all this information and the story that the individual tells and do what can be called as a Gundunkan experiment, a thought experiment where you view all the information as a creator and ask, what could I as a creator be trying to achieve in this life and with this life? Why would I as a creator even think about wanting to live such a life as this life in which I see before me? Remember, the creator is not stupid. The creator is brilliant, insightful, loving, and nurturing. So why would I as a creator create such a life? In pondering this question, insights arise. One insight that arises often is there's a need for compassion. As the old saying goes, there but for the grace of God go I. Simply said, 
if we were to experience exactly what that other person experienced and what they did, we too would be in the same place. The second sight is often about the orchestration of creation as to how interestingly events came together to create that life in its unfoldment and often insights about the individual and creation itself. Now this Gedanken experiment is best done by the person themselves when they take the position, I am the creator, I am brilliant, insightful, loving, and nurturing. Why would I create such a life and what other ways are there to tell my story? All that can be said here is to try it for yourself and see what arises. Our challenge in life is to live true to the role we chose to play. It is something that is felt and difficult for the mind to understand. So mind creates a variety of stories that it follows instead of paying attention to the internal guidance through feeling available to each of us in every moment. My opinion, of course, but do your own experiments and see what works for you and find out for yourself. One closing note here is for whatever reason you do not like this play that you are in, it suggested you create a dialogue with your higher self and ask it whatever questions you have. You can even ask it about changing your life path. I personally found all my questions have been addressed in some way, sometimes not to my liking and sometimes in a rather surprising way. Here again, all that can be said is to try it and see for yourself.